And today, our garden walk, we explore native plants for bird-friendly communities with Jillian Bell. Jillian Bell is the program coordinator for Audubon's Bird-Friendly Communities Program in Connecticut and New York. She works with community groups and program partners to restore native habitat, connect people with nature, encourage stewardship, and inspire the next generation of environmental leaders. Jillian has supported over 30 schools in Connecticut in creating native plant habitats. She also delivers professional development workshops to teaching staff to support them in taking their students outside to integrate the curriculum with the natural world. Welcome, Jillian. Hi, Penny. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so happy to be here with y'all today. Okay, so in this workshop, we will take an in-depth look at native plants um, that you can plant to make your home more bird friendly to our year round residents and those stopping over on their migration journeys. We'll also explore the importance of choosing native plants and how to select them to attract specific birds to your yard and think about uh, some additional design considerations for your home landscapes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So before I begin, I will introduce myself a little bit further. I am Jillian Bell. You all can call me Jill if you like. And uh, as was mentioned, I am the Bird Friendly Communities Program Coordinator at Audubon, Connecticut, and New York, which is the state office of the National Audubon Society. And this is a picture of me and my classmates from the fourth grade when we first learned about the importance of planting native trees. And as you can see, this really stuck with me over the years. Uh, it has informed my career choice. <laughs> Um, Audubon has five work streams, and as I mentioned, I'm on the Bird Friendly Communities team. The Bird Friendly Communities Conservation Strategy works to meet birds' needs in the places that we share with them, specifically by providing food, shelter, safe passage, and places to raise their young. In turn, birds offer us a richer, more beautiful, and helpful place to live. Nationally, we at Audubon have 22 offices, 41 centers, and 450, actually over 450 chapters that drive our work in 31 states. Um, I'm again here in Connecticut, New York, and we have chapters in dark gray. We have 27 in New York and five in Connecticut. We have our centers that are the orange and red on the map, and we have offices in Ithaca and Albany with partners. Those are in green. And then we have our sanctuaries, which is the little gray icon that looks like it has a tree on a hill, uh, with one coastal sanctuary at Guilford, and that's in blue. Anybody that wants to visit? Um, for this presentation, I'll be focusing on the plants for birds aspect of things. So back to bird family communities. Our bird friendly or our priorities are our bird safe buildings campaign, which includes our bird safe glass or windows and our lights out initiatives and our plants for birds campaign, which you're about to learn more about. Oh, sorry. For some reason, my slide got mixed up. Here we go. To get us started, let's talk about plants for birds and how it fits into the big picture. So here is the big picture. This is from Audubon's strategic plan. When we think about saving birds, we need to think about their migratory flyways and protecting birds everywhere um, that they go throughout their lives. Hundreds of species migrate through our flyway, which is the Atlantic flyway, and through our communities every spring and fall. So that means that your yard is an opportunity to fill in the gaps for migrants along the flyway and also to make sure our breeding birds and our wintering birds can succeed too. Uh, this is a wood thrush, and it's a bird whose beautiful song rings throughout our eastern forests. I hope that everybody here has been able to hear one at some point. Um, from suburban woodlots to expansive tracts of undisturbed forests, you can, you can hear them. And our forests 
unfortunately are growing more quiet as the wood thrush and many other songbirds are disappearing at an alarming rate. Uh, the story of the wood thrush is the story of what's happening in our yards, in our neighborhoods, our local parks, and our workplaces, as well as what's happening in the larger eco region and in the tropics. But the part, or part of the solution to this problem is in our yards, and each of us can make a difference. Sorry, I'm having an issue with my slide. Give me just one moment, please. Okay, here we go. I think it's running now. Um, so the map shows the breeding range of the wood thrush in blue and the winter range in orange. The arrows show typical migration routes as discovered with tracking devices, and wood thrush have a loop migration. So they'll go uh, from East Coast Florida down to Cuba in the fall, uh, and they come up the Mississippi, Mississippi River Valley in the spring. They, they breed in the understory of woodlands where there are tall trees, and they nest most successfully in large contiguous tracts of undisturbed forests but they will also nest in suburban woodlots and city parks where the, there are these tall trees. Um, so though they face many threats in these environments, they often will not reproduce successfully. They will, however, use any available green space to rest and refuel during migration. And that's where our green spaces come in handy. Unfortunately, wood thrush populations are declining by 1.8% uh, per year. Let's see, I think my slides are showing up a little bit delayed. Sorry about this, Phil. Okay, um, with a cumulative decline of 55 over the last 50 years, 55% over the last 50 years, 41% of all neotropical migratory songbirds are declining, which is very sad. Many other migratory forest birds are in decline in North America, such as cerulean warblers. Thank you. Um, so many other migratory forest birds are in decline in North America, such as the cerulean warbler, which was the little bluebird before the image that you're seeing now. And then this lovely black-throated blue warbler that's on your screen. and the rose-breasted grosbeak. So what is causing the steep decline in so many different kinds of neotropical migratory songbirds? The reasons are, or there are many reasons for the decline. These birds face threats during all phases of their life history cycles on breeding grounds, um, wintering grounds, and during migration. Habitat loss is by far the greatest factor with more than 2.5 times more influential or it is more than 2.5 times more influential than any other factor. And it's predicted by the year 2100 that over 450 bird species in the world will be listed as vulnerable, endangered, or critical. The vital role of restoring habitat in urban, suburban, and rural communities is growing. Back in the 1940s, our country looked like this. Urban centers, especially in the eastern United States, were essentially isolated cores surrounded by small farms and open land. But just within the span of a lifetime, within the last 81 years, housing densities have exploded. And it's only going to get worse. Uh, this is the projected density of housing by the year 2030, a mere nine years from now. And already we've lost a staggering 150 million acres of ecologically pro productive land to urban sprawl. We have taken uh, what was once a rich contiguous landscape of ecologically healthy land and transformed it into a sterile monoculture of turf grass lawns and decorative alien plant species. 43% has been developed into the suburban urban matrix. Um, and here's what those orange and red areas on that map that I was showing you earlier with the high uh, housing density looked like on average. 
the average American yard does not provide much food for birds to eat or even places for them to hide from predators. Lawn is more than half a yard. Lawns are fairly sterile with almost no ecological value. As far as plants that might actually be valuable to wildlife, such as trees, flowers, and shrubs, it's less than a fifth of the yard. And plants in suburban and urban areas tend to be about 80% non-native. Uh, so if we can replace some of that grass with native plants, you will also reduce your foot carbon footprint. Um, at least if you use a gas lawnmower, which puts out four times the amount of greenhouse gases as a typical car. Um, better yet, you can reduce the grass and switch to a real mower or an electric mower. Uh, my neighbor actually just got a real mower and it's really cool. <laughs> uh, then of course, we get to spend our weekends mowing the grass, contributing to those greenhouse gases I just men mentioned. According to the EPA, nearly 5% of our green greenhouse gas emissions come from lawn maintenance alone. And beyond that, homeowners spill some 17 million gallons of gasoline every year, just refueling their lawn mowers. In the U.S. alone, there are nearly 50, or 50 million acres of lawn, and we must change that paradigm. Most of the U.S. looks like this. It's neat, simple, uh, but lifeless. This landscape was developed for convenience and to celebrate the lawn as a status symbol, but it was not designed to share with other living things other than grass and a few Asian ornamental plants. The landscaping industry and our own views of beautiful lawn um, and our own views of a beautiful lawn have been dominated by things such as decorative value, but we must balance this by adding back the values that nature already provided for free, such as food webs, soil retention, carbon sequestration, and frankly, in my opinion, a beauty unrivaled by any manicured lawn. Restoring native plants to our communities is vital to preserving biodiversity. By simply choosing native plants, uh, no matter where you live, you can help sustain wildlife. You can begin one plant at a time, Ask your nursery or garden center for native plant alternatives to the standard alien ornamentals. Um, over time, you can reduce the amount of your turf grass lawn. Your native plant garden will help create corridors connecting and supporting larger natural areas. Native insects eat native plants, pretty much only native plants. Uh, insects are specialists, and for the most part, they can only eat the plants with which they have co-evolved over millions of years. Our native insects are not adapted to feed on alien plant species, which dominate our traditional urban and suburban landscapes. Uh, the exotic plants that the landscaping industry are, you can find there are for the most part unpalatable to our native insects. Uh, the important of importance of native plants to all animals, including humans, is especially dependent on insects, particularly the caterpillars and butterflies, uh, of butterflies and moths. Plants are the only organisms that can transform the energy of the sun into food. All of that finally brings me to what you can do in your yard to transform the outdoor spaces into a bird sanctuary. We'll go through birds' basic needs, food, water, shelter, and places to nest. I'll go over what birds need throughout the year because uh, you will help them the most by planning for all seasons. And for inspiration, I recommend the book, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. He's an entomologist based in Pennsylvania and he's put numbers on why native plants matter. Native plants are not just important as hosts to insects, but many native shrubs and trees produce fruit with high energy and fat content, which is particularly important for birds building up their fat reserves for fall migration. A recent study by Susan Smith et al. Um, found that migratory songbirds consumed fruits from native plants like the stockwood at a faster rate than fruits from invasive plants. And the fruits of the native plants are of greater nutritional value to migrating birds than fruits of native plants, or invasive plants, pardon me. Spicebush is a must-have plant for helping migratory birds. I actually just planted two of these in my yard myself. Uh, Spicebush is a super high-fat fruit. They can make up um, their, their makeup can be up to 50% fat. So if a wood thrush lands in your yard and there are spicebush berries, then they have got it made. The chickadee pear brings 390 
to 570 caterpillars to their nest per day. Chickadees feed their young for 16 days before they fledge. So that's 570 caterpillars for 16 days. That'll equal over 9,000 caterpillars that they have to find for their young to fully fledge. That's a lot of caterpillars. <laughs> In order to grow the caterpillars that birds need to feed their young, those caterpillars need native plants. To illustrate this difference, take a look at these two groups of trees. Our native oaks in the genus Quercus are the best trees for caterpillars, hosting over 530 species of caterpillars, whereas ginkgo, a commonly planted ornamental landscaping tree from Asia, supports only 4% uh, or four species of caterpillars. If the insects cannot eat the plants in our own landscape, then the food chain is essentially broken. When you are a bird in search of food for your young, that can be a life-threatening difference. Um, and I do just want to clarify that when I say, I know there might be people on that aren't um, in the Northeast, that's any kind of oak, like whatever your native oak tree is. It's not specific oak, native oaks in the Northeast that I'm mentioning here. Here are some of those numbers um, that I mentioned earlier by Dr. Doug Tallamy. Here, he has shown the importance of native plants by documenting the number of caterpillars hosted by each plant genus. This list shows the best native genera of trees ranked by the numbers of caterpillar species each one hosts. Our message is quite simple. Choose the best for birds plants when you landscape your outdoor space. And here are uh, two of his books that I, The Nature's Best Hope just came out recently and then Bringing Nature Home has been out for a while, and it's a, a great read. Uh, one of my favorite books by him is The Living Landscape. It One, it's just a beautiful book, but it has lots of tips in it, and in the back there is a section that can help you pick native plants um, wherever you are in the country. Uh, and then The Pollinator Victory Garden is also another one he signed. Uh, so this is not just about birds. Native plant landscaping improves the health and well-being of people too. And having healthy green outdoor space is fundamental to the health of our families. It increases our physical health, it can reduce our stress, save us time, increase property value. Uh, the list goes on and on. So next we're going to get to food, glorious food. Our four food groups for birds are nectar, which is a sweet treat for hummingbirds that attract insect pollinators, um, seeds, which are nutrient rich, long lasting. Uh, you can maintain seed heads through the winter and it also harbors overwintering insects for them. And berries, which will have fat to fuel their migration. I'm just letting my slides catch up with me. <laughs> and insects. Without native plants, we won't have the insects, and without the insects, we won't have the birds. In the spring, when the hummingbirds return to the north, early blooming wildflowers, such as this wild columbine, Aquagelia canadensis, um, will provide important nutrition after their long journey. Columbine blooms March uh, through May, Hummingbirds are great pollinators. Those European honeybees get all the attention, but hummingbirds pollinate over 160 native plants in North America. And here's a ruby-throated hummingbird uh, on its way south for the winter. They have a 500-mile nonstop crossing of the Gulf of Mexico to get to their wintering grounds. And if they don't have enough fat to make it across the Gulf to the Yucatan, uh, they can drown. So your yard is on its way and it can be just the pit stop to rest and refuel that it needs to help um, stay nice and fat for the long journey ahead. Because who knows when they'll be able to stop and refuel again. Um, having native nectar sources for refueling such as cardinal flower is a great way to support our hummers on their journeys back south. And here a ruby throat feeds on orange jewelweed, which is impatience capensis. Not all nectar plants frequented by hummingbirds are red. Uh, jewelweed is a good choice for a bird from the garden. It's a late season bloomer, blooming from July through September. If you find a big patch of jewelweed, either species, uh, you're guaranteed to see hummers in the fall. This is yellow jewelweed. 
Um, and other great plants for fall migration would be turtle head and blazing star. As she builds her nest and raises babies, she'll still need nectar from these summer flowers, such as this coral honeysuckle, uh, which is a great nectar bearing plant, which flowers from March through July. Trumpet vine is another good hummingbird vine, uh, and it blooms from June through October. And its name, scientific name is Campsus radicans. This is a purple cone flower. This is a popular landscaping plant and it's cherished by the goldfinch. <clears throat> I just planted some leaves in my yard as well. This bird is often overlooked in the winter because he loses his lemony yellow fe feathers. Uh, they're still yellow, they're just not popping as much. Um, but you can keep them in your yard by not deadheading everything in sight. Um, so leaving the flower heads on the flowers. Um, you can let some of the flowers go to seed and those finches will thank you. These seeds last through March as well and they even provide food for early spring migrants. Black-eyed Susans are another good one to have around for fall blooms and winter seeds. You want to have a cascade of flowers that produce seeds for finches and sparrows that provide food throughout the winter. Uh, so if you leave plenty of flowers uh, and again resist deadheading the blossoms, you'll be doing them a favor. Um, finches will use the fluff from thistles for nesting materials and will eat the seeds from these as well. This is a palm warbler on goldenrod and there's also some little blue stem on the right, the goldenrod's on the left. Uh, both of these plants have seeds from October through March. So if you invite these plants into your yard, you'll have birds around all winter too. Uh, winter weeds. If you leave wildflowers with your seed heads, it'll provide food for winter for birds like juncos. Um, on the left, I have mostly ironweed and joe pie weed, um, and this is at one of our sanctuaries called Bench of the River. Um, and then on the right, I have rattlesnake master, which is also another great winter weed. Berries. There are many benefits of berries uh, or berry producing shrubs and trees. I just planted quite a few berry producing shrubs and trees in my own yard. Uh, as you can tell, I just, I've been doing a lot of native plant work here. We just bought our house last year. And so this is our first spring and we've really <laughs> gotten out there. Um, so I can't wait for them to bring some birds to my yard. The Burroughs Audubon Society of Great, Greater Kansas City um, came out with this this uh, list of berries for birds, non-native versus native or native versus non-native. And it shows that the fruits are higher in fat and energy for native plants. And like I mentioned earlier, they're consumed by birds at higher rates than the fruits of invasive species. Uh, what this means is that berries give birds calories necessary to, to complete their migratory journey, whereas non-native shrubs do not supply some sufficient amounts of energy and can put migratory birds in peril by not meeting their nutritional needs. And here is another, I just wanted to show another uh, study. This one was done by Carolyn Summers, um, and, or it's in her book. And Northern Bayberry, as you can see, is 50% fat. So there's, there's a lot of uh, fat content in berries for our native species. Uh, during each of the seasons, most birds need their habitat to provide certain food types. In the spring, the birds have just returned from migration and need an abundance of insects to rebuild mussels and prepare for the nesting season. Berries that ripen during the summertime, uh, food for overworked adult birds who are trying to keep up with, the, with feeding their young and defending their territories are important in the summertime. And some good examples of that are service berries or wild grape. Uh, those are really good summer fruits. As well as our blueberries. They are the ultimate bird and people friendly plant. And I like snacking on blueberries myself. And in the fall, fat heavy fruits like this red elderberry or the spice bush that I showed you earlier to fuel long distance autumnal flights are great. For winter, in addition to those winter weed sources that I mentioned, 
tough fruits that can withstand harsh winter uh, harsh winters to fuel cold bellies are great additions for our overwintering year-round residents and visiting winter migrants. Eastern red cedar, which provided berries for the winter for waxlings, bluebirds, robins, thrashers, and also goldfinches. Goldfinches love this plant, uh, and it's evergreen, so it can provide cover year-round, which is really important. Fruits like these winterberry hollies actually get softer and more palatable to birds with every freeze-thaw cycle. And now I'll quickly take you on a native plant database tour that Audubon has, just so you know how to use this tool to find out which native plants um, you can have in your own area. So Audubon's native plants database has been designed to help people find answers and get involved. Simply enter your zip code here, as well as your email if you'd like to be able to receive an emailed plant list. Uh, you don't have to enter your email if you don't want to. Again, it's just if you want the plant list that you come up with at the very end to be emailed to you. Um, so you enter in your zip code and or your email address and you click search. The database is filterable by the type of plant that you're looking for. So you can have annuals, grasses, trees, vines, you select whichever you'd like. Um, and you can also select by the type of resource for birds that it provides. So if you want nectar, caterpillars, nuts, you know, whichever you're looking for, you just select that. Um, and by the type of bird that you'd like to attract, you can select that as well. If you go to the local resources tab, uh, local Audubon chapters are suggested for local support and guidance along with suggestions of other local and regional resources such as native plant societies to help get the user uh, or to help you get started on a native plant habitat for birds. Further down the local resources tab, you'll find an expandable list of local nurseries that supply native plants along with online retailers and an interactive nursery map. Structural considerations. Uh, it's important to provide structure or different layers to your habitat. Is there, <clears throat> excuse me, space for that robin to run around searching for worms or for that bluebird to swoop in uh, while catching insects? Is there cover to protect them from inclement weather and from predators? Are there tall perches from which that song sparrow can sing to find a mate? Each layer of vegetation supports different species. Thrushes and wrens, which feed in the soil and leaf litter, inhabit the ground layer. There they'll find insects, worms, and rugs. Hawks, swallows, and flycatchers keep a lookout for aerial prey from the overstory. And in between, woodpeckers, chickadees, hummingbirds, finches, they'll all find food and shelter among the shrubs in the understory. These layers mimic a plant community, uh, starting at the soil. You should not need to amend the soil. Uh, you should plant for whatever you have. You have rocky and dry, there's a plant for that. Clay filled and slow draining, there's a plant for that too. Uh, with the exceptions being if you want to plant food in soils with toxins or heavy metals, then you should use raised bed. Uh, ground cover layer of grasses and sedges and leafy perennials will help with stormwater management, erosion control, um, ground cover filler, and weed and invasive control. This layer can replace your mulch. You can think of it as green mulch. Seasonal theme layers are taller with brighter colors while the structural layer is taller still and grows in between others, never in isolation. As we proceed, I wanna to highlight two of the references that I use often. Um, I know I already mentioned the living landscape. I really do love it. I stuck in my presentation twice, if that's any emphasis on it. <laughs> and um, also planting in a post wild world. So first off, this is not our goal. Um, I always feel funny saying that because it looks like a, a normal manicured thing. Um, but many traditional plantings have open soil or unfilled niches, allowing sunlight to directly reach the ground. And this is a problem because it can raise soil temperature dramatically and lead to quick evaporation of plant essential soil moisture. 
It also leaves an opening for invasive species to take over those open areas, and that can be a pain, let me tell you. Think of green roof plantings, for example, and the extreme conditions plants are exposed to there. If roof media is exposed, it dries out quickly, and surface temperatures can reach 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Many species don't survive such extreme conditions if planted in traditional masses or spaced too far apart. We want to plant for success. <clears throat> the microclimate around your plants and growing conditions improve significantly if gaps between taller species are filled with tough ground covering plants, such as Pennsylvania sedge in this picture. Uh, the filled niche creates better growing conditions for more demanding species because surface temperatures will stay low and moisture remains accessible for plant roots. So filling the ground niche benefits the entire planting. And this is from Planting in a Post-Wild World, that book I just showed. Something to think about when planning your native plant garden is where on the sliding scale of visibility and functionality you fall. Both are totally valid. Garden colors, whereas a highly functional one features less homogeny in structure and color and allows for unrefined plants. Here are some examples of native plant gardens. Um, we've got large scale here, which is a, a, a meadow. We have a smaller scale. And you can see there's different, um, I guess, sections to their, their planting here. And then still smaller scale, this one is like a very small patio, or it, the patio itself isn't small, but the planting, it's small and it has uh, containers here because there's not a lot of uh, in-ground planting that can be done. So if you notice here, there's no heavy brown line of mulch like in the photo I showed you a, a few slides back. Um, so I just want to flag, I remember Patty asking me to flag that when I was coming towards the end of the presentation, so I'll just go ahead and flag it now. Uh, so if you'll have any additional questions, then you can put that into the chat box now. Y'all can go ahead and start doing that. I do have some more slides, but just to let y'all know. So as we begin to think about the layers or physical structures and components of the habitats we're trying to amend, supplement, or create, Let's review the basic requirements of a bird habitat. Native plants provide birds with the four food groups, insects, berries, seeds, and nectar. Birds need clean water for drinking, bathing, keeping cool, and maintaining their feathers all year long. Birds nest shelter, or birds need shelter for nesting, protection from the weather, and hiding spots for both predators and prey. Birds uh, use natural and man-made materials to build their nests. They need a protected space to nest and raise their young. And all of that equals habitat. So this is um, technically my last slide, but there's a good bit here to unpack. So, before I leave you, I wanted to just go over some other considerations to keep in mind as you're planning to attract more birds to your outdoor spaces. Um, things like water features and access to water. And I have both of those listed because the water features are more for wildlife, whereas access to water is more for you, uh, especially in the first year or two after you planted your native plants, they will require a little bit uh, more watering. Uh, to become established. And once they've become established, then whatever amount of rain that's out there should be enough for them. Because again, they're native, they're used to the amount of rainfall that they're gonna get. But to help them become established, you're gonna need to water them. And so you might wanna think about, is there water near there? Well, I need to get a watering can or set up a rain barrel. Um, that's something you can think about. You also, if you're uh, in the, the beginning stages and working with a blank canvas, think about your traffic patterns. Um, how do you want to use your outdoor space? It doesn't have to just be like random native plants out there. We want it to be functional for wildlife, but also functional for you. We want you to be able to enjoy your, your space. So if you want to have an area where you're seated or if there's an area where 
your kids or grandkids, grandkids like to run and play, maybe don't put your plantings in that specific area. Um, you can also think about the amount of sun that you're getting. Different plants, uh, native plants will need different amounts of sun uh, as would any plant. So take that into consideration when you're thinking about your space. The soil moisture, some plants uh, like cardinal flower or great dogwood or button bush, they like more moist soil. So you wouldn't wanna put them in a really sunny area that will probably get dried out um, or if it drains well, it'll get dried out. Um, so take into account the soil moisture of the area that you're looking at um, for your planting. And also plant height. That is something that I didn't take into consideration when I was planting in the front of my house. Um, I planted some wildflowers leading up to my house and the heights of them are perfectly fine, but they're a little bit different than what I initially would have liked. And so that was, I didn't listen to my own advice when I did that. And then maintenance requirements. Um, are you going to need to trim back whatever it is that you planted because you planted it too close to your window? Um, I have friends who planted a red osier dogwood that's really close to their window and it loves the space that it's in and it, it's getting really big and it blocks their window so they often will have to trim it back um, and it doesn't mind it's still doing quite well where it is. Um, or is it something that will look very messy? Um, birds don't mind mess. I personally don't mind mess but if, if you mind mess then that's something that you could think about as well if it's something that you're going to have to go in and trim or do something of that sort. Um, another important uh, maintenance piece that people tend to forget generally is invasive species removal. Uh, that's a big one because invasives can take over your native plant habitat and <laughs> just drive you crazy over time. I'm battling uh, some black swallow wart here where I am right now and some bittersweet. Um, so, if you can nip that in the bud early, then it, you'll just have a, a much better experience with your native plants. So that is my presentation. I flew through it. Uh, I was talking really fast because I was worried I wouldn't get through it in time and, and now I see that I have. So I have included my email address here. I'm currently on part-time maternity leave, but I will be checking my emails on Wednesdays and Thursdays uh, between now and Labor Day. So if y'all have any questions or are like, what's this plant that's in my yard and you want some help identifying it or want to run through something or even just share photos of native plants that you have that you're like, this plant is doing so well here and I just wanted to share with you. I'm happy to receive all of those emails. Um, so feel free to reach out. I am happy to connect. And I'll hand it back over to Penny to help us get through our, or to lead us through the questions and answers if there are any questions out there. Excellent, thank you so much, Jillian. Well, we got off to a little rough start, but eventually the the video was syncing okay with your audio. So thank you for your perseverance. We do <laughs> have- sure. Thanks for bearing with me. <clears throat> we do have several questions. Uh, the first one I just love, it's, this is a viewer who's interested and curious about your fourth grade class and who the teacher was and how that teacher happened to be motivated to teach the lesson on native trees. Sure. You know what? I actually never asked her. Uh, my teacher's name is Miss Manella, and I went to St. Paul Catholic School in Birmingham, Alabama. That's where I'm originally from. So I live here in Connecticut now. And Miss Minnell, just my whole school, they were very like, good about getting us out and about. Um, it's interesting because at my school, we actually didn't have very many plants. My school was in downtown Birmingham. So it was all concrete around me. We had a gravel playground and there was cement. The only tree or plant that I remember seeing at my school was a dogwood that grew on the other side of a brick wall um, outside of the, the fence. It was like a a brick wall with a, a gate that opened on that side. Um, and I remember seeing that dogwood. Uh, it was a female dogwood. So I remember the smell of the dogwood and that's one of the, the ways you can tell. So yeah, I'm not sure how she connected with saying like, hey, we want to get y'all to do this. But I remember it was an Arbor Day celebration 
and we got to go down to City Hall and we actually planted a tree down at City Hall. Uh, that's what we were doing that day. And we all, each of us got to leave with our own little tree uh, in, in those little plastic cups that you saw. Nice, very nice. Uh, as much as I love seeing your smiling face, I'm noticing that the audio is slowing down. So I think that may be a bandwidth issue. So if I could ask you to turn off the video and we'll continue with the Q&A. Oh, I'll turn off my video. Okay, great. Uh, Next question, how do you get rid of a lawn or do you really have? Did, did that work? Yes, that, yes, that's much better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, how do you get rid of a lawn or do you really have to? Can you just leave it unmowed and start interspersing with native plants? That is another great question. Um, I, it's honestly, it's whatever you are able to do. I would never want this to feel like it is a, a burden. Um, we want this to be enjoyable so that you stick with it. Uh, that being said, to remove lawn is not necessarily the easiest. <laughs> I just removed the lawn from the health strip in front of my house. So that little patch of grass between my, uh, my lawn and the street. And it took my husband and I a, a bit of effort to get it up just because it was so compact and that grass was so very well established. They do sell uh, tools. We didn't use them, but they do sell tools that you can use to help remove lawn or sod um, where you can kind of go through and cut it into strips and then you, you roll it off, like similar to how you roll it back on uh, or roll it on in the first place. So there's definitely different ways you can go about removing it. Last year, when we first moved in, I did a little bit of a fall planting here and I did not want to take out all of my, my lawn um, because I was uh, just, I wasn't interested in it at the time. And so I dug out spaces to put my native plants and I found that when the plants went to bed for the winter and were coming back this spring, that that grass had grown in around them and it was, a bit difficult for me to locate where my plants were that I had planted because I, I grew those plants from seeds. Um, and so that was a bit of a challenge. This year we took out, again, like I said, bigger sections and it's been so nice. We've mulched in the meantime to help keep the soil moisture uh, at a, a happy level for the plants and also to protect them from the sun um, or at least their roots from, from too much heat. And hopefully it'll help with any invasive seeds that might be blowing around this year. Uh, that black swallow that I mentioned earlier, <laughs> Ooh, it really does take a hold. So it, it really is up to you uh, if you wanna try to tackle taking out the lawn um, or if you wanna do it piece by piece. I think I would recommend taking it out in chunks, even if you don't do, like I don't think you're planning on doing your whole yard, but if you pick a section and do a section at a time, I think that that's totally manageable. Okay, we have several folks who have experience with this that have uh, popped comments uh, into the question panel. They recommend that you look up lasagna uh, gardening, which is a layering technique. Also, you can use newspapers, cardboard, or a uh, a rolled paper that you can buy in uh, big box stores called Ram Board. Uh, and that acts very similarly to cardboard, but you have the advantage of it being a long roll. So you anchor it along the sides and it's not a lot of small pieces, but that has to be covered with mulch or wood chips or both. So do a little research and I'm sure you'll be able to find ways to eliminate part or all of your lawn to incorporate natives. Um, we have a question about what you recommend for native plants in a very tiny urban garden. What would be the best bang for the buck in that space?
Ooh, um, I would definitely go with, if it's a tiny urban space, that's tough because I really do love spice bush, but spice bush can get to be a bit bigger. Um, so I would maybe go with, um, oh, what is it? I'm, butterfly weed, sorry. <laughs> My brain is like gone. Um, just because it can take the sun, it's great for pollinators and and it's also great for, for birds as well. So that's one that I would recommend, butterfly weed. It's a type of milkweed. And let's see, I really like having flocks around. I guess it depends on if you're trying to attract more birds or pollinators specifically, or if you want it to be a caterpillar host plant, so it's good for both. Um, I guess I need to see like what the space was. Sure. Winterberry holly is a really nice one. It's a deciduous holly um, that'll have really lovely little red berries on it. So it'll provide some berries for birds and it, it'll, it can stay small. Okay. <clears throat> um, it just, it really depends on, I don't know if you want to comment to say what the size of the space is. I can maybe help you better. <laughs> sure. And what native plants did you end up putting in your hell strip or do you recommend for a traffic island? Sure. I planted um, purple echinacea or purple coneflower uh, echinacea. And I have, I actually put baptisia out there. Baptisia australis, and which is false blue indigo, and we planted some bee balm out there, which I'm really excited to see come up. And I planted that uh, butterfly weed that I mentioned. I didn't want anything to be too tall to to potentially block the view of the house. Um, it, I don't have it out there uh, in the hellstrip specifically, but if when I, I actually have a little bit of a section to go still, I'm planning to add some tick seed. Tick seed is another great one that you could put out there. Um, a little coreopsis. Uh, it's probably a sunflower. That's a really nice one. I'm actually like taking a peek out there right now just to see like what I what I put out there. Um, I think those are the main ones that I have for right now. Okay, very good. They do well with the heat and they don't mind if they get a bit dried out. Okay, very good. Um, what small trees or shrubs would you recommend? And a follow on question can trees and shrubs be planted as screening by the road, or is that a danger to fledglings? That's a great question. Um, my favorite shrub to plant, <clears throat> I'll answer that question first, is surface berries. Um, there's different surface berries depending on where you're located. Uh, they're native to you. And I love surface berries, one, because they have a uh, really great nutritional value for birds and their berries. And they have gorgeous flowers in the uh, spring, like late spring, early summer. Actually, no, just spring. Uh, you'll have beautiful flowers on it. Um, and then in the fall, they have beautiful colors on their leaves. Um, Very good. It, it works with you throughout the seasons, which I think is really lovely. Um, and so I would recommend the service fairy. Another really nice one, depending on where you are. It's not needed everywhere. Um, oh, can, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, hello, we're we're having a little bit of delay in your audio. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, a red bud would all red bud. Oh yes, very good. Uh, what? Who did the research on the berry value for the? Is this any better? Let's 
Sorry, I'll repeat the question. Who did the research on can you the hear me? I can hear you. Are you I'll not hearing me? Oh, we seem to be having more difficulties with the audio. And there's just a little bit of a delay. Um, hmm. So I'll try one more time and then perhaps I should try to capture these questions and email them to you. But I'll try one more time. Who did the research uh, that rated the berry values for the birds? Sure. Um, so the berry values that I showed um, were from the Burroughs Audubon Society of Greater Kansas City. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Can you recommend a fast growing native shrub to replace invasive bamboo? Oh, that one's tough. A fast growing native shrub that will replace native bamboo. Native bamboo is just so, so hard. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's fast growing and a shrub. Off the top of my head, honestly, I cannot think of one. Um, that's one of the reasons why invasives are invasive because they just outcompete our native plants um, and will take over an area. So it's, it's tough to find a native that is as aggressive as it needs to be to make an invasive not as much of an issue. Um, yeah, that one's tough. I, I may have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, we have a few questions about bird feeders. Okay. My understanding is that uh, some baffles that are the metal round cylinders work very well. I have had good experience with that, but have you had any other suggestions for uh, keeping squirrels off the feeders? Um, I would definitely say baffles for sure. Um, and then I would think about placement. Uh, if you have your bird feeders close to a tree where a squirrel could jump from that, uh, over to the feeder, that maybe wouldn't be as helpful. And then you could also think about height. I have one of the schools that I work with here in New Haven has a shepherd's hook uh, with their bird feeder on it. And I have seen squirrels hop up to the top of the, from the ground, they, they're, they're great jumpers, um, hop up to the top from the ground and actually work together to take the feeder off of the shepherd's hook. I could not believe my eyes and they tried to run away with it. It was too heavy, but they tried to, to run off with it and it was at an event. So like there were multiple people seeing this happen. Uh, squirrels are crafty. I would definitely just recommend using that baffle and also making sure that it's not near something that they can jump from to get onto it. Okay, good, good tips. The other bird question is, is there a problem with leaving bird feeders up in the summer if there is still a lot of activity from a wide range of bird species that are coming to the feeders? That's another great question. Um, so bird feeders are great for bringing birds closer so that people can see them. Um, in Depending on where you live, birds don't actually need the bird feeders to survive. If you're in a more urban area or even some sub suburban areas where there is not a lot of native plants near you, then yes, uh, having a bird feeder can be helpful um, to supplement their diet. One thing about bird feeders is, especially in the summertime, like I find that in the winter, having a bird feeder is great, but in the summer, there's usually more availability of food for them. 
Um, and in the spring, they're really looking for those insects uh, to give to their young. So they, they wouldn't get that out of bird feeder. Um, but you also wanna keep an eye out and make sure you're keeping your bird feeder clean. I don't know how many of y'all heard about the recent salmonella outbreak that has kind of been plaguing our, our birds this year. They can be vectors for diseases for birds if you're not maintaining your bird feeder and keeping it clean. Um, and you help reduce the rate of birds that are getting salmonella if they are, if you have planted your bird feeders versus having one that you're filling with seed. Okay. Um... Any suggestions for keeping the neighborhood cats that are outdoor cats away from your bird feeder? Another great question. Um, I have yet to find a way to keep a cat away from a bird feeder. Um, you could try, I, mean, I don't know if you really want to, but you could try using some sort of a pepper spray potentially to keep them away. I know that sometimes helps with squirrels. Um, though the squirrels at my house don't mind, they like the spice. <laughs> um, that's the main thing that I could think of with, in regards to cats. We really do ask for folks to have their cats stay indoors because they do eat so many of our songbirds. Um, I have a cat myself and he lives inside. He loves to look at his bird TV, uh, but I don't let him outside for that reason. Um, so the only thing I could think of would just be to, to potentially, if you feel comfortable asking your neighbors to maybe keep cats inside, uh, which I know is tough and challenging and can be a tricky situation. Um, and other than that, that's all I have for you. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. All right. The expression for cats is an expression for a reason. Cats do what they want to do. <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, have you heard about a shortage of hummingbirds uh, this summer. Someone has a hummingbird feeder that's usually visited by lots of hummingbirds and there are none this year. Hmm. That's a great question. I, I haven't heard of anything yet, but my own personal observations, I have noticed that hummingbirds, the ones that I have seen came up a little bit later this year. Um, and I've, just, I've been seeing them in places where I haven't necessarily seen them before. So I don't know if they're just shifting where they want to hang out or, or what's going on with the hummingbirds this year. Um, but I'm, I appreciate that observation uh, that the question asker All right. asks if they're paying attention to that. Very good. Uh, do you have any recommendations specific for native plants for bluebirds? Mm, great question. So for bluebirds, it's not as much about the, the type of plants that you plant um, for them. They're, the big thing for a bluebird is the actual space that you have for them. Um, they need that space to be able to swoop. I don't know if you notice wherever you usually will see bluebirds, they like to have a, a higher perch. Um, and I often see bluebirds over fields or near gardens where it's kind of open, like there aren't necessarily a lot of trees. They like to swoop to get insects. So that's the kind of space that they need in order to be happy that they'll want to hang out in. Um, yeah, so bluebirds will tend to like a little bit more open spaces, more so than any one particular type of plant that will attract them. Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a, a plant ID app that you recommend for identification? Sure. Uh, I think iNaturalist is a really great one. I was using a different one called Picture This, which was a bit some tiny. It could get me to um, the type of plant, maybe not the specific one, but it would say like, oh, this is an oak or this is a aster, but it wouldn't tell me what kind of aster or sometimes it would tell me what kind of oak. Um, but I noticed that with that app, it would say that asters, which are a great pollinator plant and they are native, were weeds. And so I, I was like, oh, I can't, 
in good conscience use this app because it's telling people that beneficial plants that are native to our area are weeds and that they should be like removed. Um, so I would use a reputable app and the one that I recommend would be iNaturalist. Good suggestion. Can you recommend any plants that would provide food in winter for the birds that do not migrate? Sure. Uh, if you're looking for a tree, eastern red cedar is a great tree to have. Uh, those juniper berries will be able to withstand winter and give them some lovely fruits as well as cover in the winter. Um, American holly, same thing. It's evergreen and it'll have those berries on it. The berries, a lot of times, if I don't know if people, like if you've noticed that sometimes those berries hang around for a bit, it's because they aren't as sweet or uh, soft and palatable to the birds when they initially are formed, they really do need a freeze and thaw cycle to make them better. So they get, they get better over time. Um, and let's see, what's another good one for the winter? I would definitely recommend winter seeds, um, that rattlesnake master that I mentioned, uh, even your purple coneflower, some of those seeds will hang around through the winter. Uh, any any kind of grasses. I don't know if you are interested in that. There's little blue stem that's a really nice one, and it doesn't get as tall as big blue stem. Uh, so it just depends on the type of plant you're looking for. If you're looking for more of a tree or a shrub or a grass or a flower, um, but as long as it's providing a berry that is a bit more tough. Uh, so I don't know if you felt a juniper berry. They're they're a little bit thicker skinned. Than say a blueberry, which is nice and soft, and that's a berry that you want to have around in the summertime. So tougher berries and some seeds that'll stick around are, are great to have for winter feeding the birds that are overwintering. Okay, very good. Uh, someone mentioned that burning American burning bush was mentioned as a good berry source, but as an invasive species. Shouldn't there be other considerations like high bush blueberries? Could, could you repeat that question for me? It wasn't that I didn't hear you. I just want to make sure I fully understand it. Well, it appears that this person thinks that you recommended American burning bush, but perhaps. Oh, no. Okay. All right. I don't have that one in my presentation. All right. We we don't recommend burning bush at all. So No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Just good clarification. Uh, how important is leaf litter for insects that birds eat? Oh, it's so important. I'm not sure if you've ever seen song sparrows um, or juncos. They, they hang out on the ground and they're like scratching around in the leaf litter. It's because they're looking for insects. Um, that are also hanging out in the leaf litter. Uh, that leaf litter provides little microclimates with moisture and it's protected from the sun and it keeps them nice and cool. So having a leaf litter layer is absolutely fantastic. It's also a great way to keep invasive seeds from getting to your soil. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people want to get those leaves up because they look messy, um, but they have a great ecological value. Um, if you if you leave them down uh, for birds and also for the insects that are going to eat them. Okay. Sorry, for birds and the insects that they're going to eat. <laughs> yes, yes, good. Um, how late in the fall or is it spring that you recommend cutting back and deadheading last year's plants? How late? What was that? How late in the fall or do you? recommend spring cutbacks? I would recommend spring cutbacks because uh, they will usually like the, the seed heads will be ready probably in the fall and they'll use them over the winter and so if you can leave them until spring that would be ideal because they'll be able to eat those seeds throughout the winter time. Very good. Um, a lot of neighbors are worried about their children and ticks, and, mm -hmm. and so they are spraying everything with mosquito spray, as well as many towns are instituting 
mosquito spraying program, just how deadly is that spray to other insects and ultimately birds? That's a great question. Um, so there, mosquitoes are a food for, for bats as well. So I, I definitely see the eco ecological value of them. They're also a pollinator of blueberries, um, which I found out recently. So as much as I don't like being bitten by mosquitoes, I also recognize that they have an important role in our ecosystem. Um, in terms of the effect of the spray that they have, I don't know very much about that spray. They don't spray in my town, thankfully, for mosquitoes. Um, but I'm sure that that spray has to have some other effect on, on an invertebrate species. Um, I'm just not sure what exactly it is. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, we have a couple of suggestions that I will just go ahead and share. Uh, another good plant ID app is GoBotany. Uh, that's from the Native Plant Trust. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Inkberry is another good uh, winter birds food source, as well as winterberry highlight. Uh, Winterberry Holly, the Ilex family. Yeah. Um, next question is, are white lights at night bad for birds? Mm. It, it depends, <laughs> is the answer that I'm going to give you. Um, would, if you have birds that are nesting in your trees, um, they actually might not want to nest in your trees if you have lights like that around. Um, I don't know if you've tried sleeping with a, a bright light shining on you. It's not the most comfortable. Um, and they, those lights honestly affect moth populations more so, I would say, than birds. Um, but larger lights, like lights from buildings, can be disorienting for, for birds. I wouldn't necessarily say from a house. Um, oh, sorry, I just saw a question come in. I'll address it in a moment about the anonymous. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, so more so lights from buildings, not necessarily like your floodlight or something like that. It may just deter them from wanting to hang out in your yard because it's a bright light. Um, and then I wanted to go, I see that there's an audience question about uh, anonymous being on one of the slides. It says, I, I also saw Euonymus in one of the slides, but I believe it wasn't referring to burning bush, but to the Euonymus americanus, also known as strawberry bush and hearts of Buston. Um, one of the slides that I have does have uh, Euonymus on it, and it was in reference to comparing native versus non-native uh, the berries from those fruits um, in terms of nutritional value to, to bolster the thought that natives are more beneficial than non-natives. Um, and in addition to being a non-native, Euonymus is an invasive species. Um, so definitely don't go around <laughs> planting winged Euonymus. Thank, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, sure. how, how often do you need to clean hummingbird feeders? And you also mentioned the importance of cleaning bird feeders. How often would you recommend cleaning them? That's a great question. Um, I don't know what the official answer is on that. I try to clean my bird feeder once a week. And if it's particularly busy or rainy, um, like if it just looks really gross, um, I will clean it more than that. Or if I notice that there are birds on it that have that uh, salmonella infection, like you can tell they'll have like one eye that's shut or maybe even both of their eyes look like they're puffy and closing. Um, they just don't look well, then I'll, I'll clean them more than that. Very good. Um, we have a recommendation to check with your local extension office. And that that really is a great suggestion as well as checking with your master gardener 
programs in your area for specific native plants for your region since we have listeners from all over the country. So great suggestion. Uh, okay. and, and the this next question is, oh, I guess this is a comment. Is the app that you recommended iHerbalist? iNaturalist. iNaturalist, very good. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We've run over time, but I appreciate you sticking with us. And we appreciate all of these wonderful photos and the terrific information you've shared. We will surely be inspired to go out and plant more native plants for the birds and keep our feathered friends happy. So thank you again, Jillian. We appreciate your time.